going to continue with uh, normal modes. Remember, these are um, it's a general concept, and uh, not just in acoustics, but a lot of different subjects where you have a response of a system. And we're thinking of an undriven, undamped system when we think of this. Okay, undriven, undamped. There are these responses where there's just a single frequency of the motion. And that's what a normal mode is. And once you know the normal modes, you actually know a lot because by superposing them, you can, you can represent any motion of the system. And they have nice properties. They have this orthogonality property that we've briefly discussed before. Oh yeah, I forgot. They, uh, this, this, all I'm supposed to do here is click to acknowledge and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Do you guys know what that is? Have, were you informed about it? What, what, what? The new alert system. Yeah, yeah, we have this uh, new. I saw, see, I saw it. They said it's recommended that you install it, but then uh, they it's said it's not what they told me. Yeah, I got this message saying, "Oh, you better install this software." But I, I always hold off until I really have to. Strong if you know, I'm going to deduct from my paycheck, it's that kind of a thing. That's <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so this is a little bit different perspective. This can cause. This has caused me some confusion. We looked at you know st strings before where they were driven right there we can set the drive frequency to be anything we want to and we end up looking at the resonances right well this is a little different perspective here which there's no drive we're going to ask for the normal modes which in this case are just going to be the standing wave modes definite frequency so it's related to what we did before but it's a little different perspective and the notion of impedance carries over here. Now before we were thinking there's an, a drive external to the system, right? And the impedance seen by the drive is the complex force divided by the complex velocity. Well, we can apply it here. Um, this is, look at this subsystem right here. This is the termination. of. The, we're going to have two different terminations of the string here, of a string. If we focus our attention on this termination right here, this force exerted by the string is external to this subsystem. So we can define impedance here. It would be the force of the string divided by the velocity of, of the string, transverse velocity here. So this is, this is not a big deal, but I just wanted to mention it because we're extending, you know, the notion of impedance is more general than what we were thinking of before. But it's a small step here, okay, to just focus your attention on this, call this the system, and now we got this force, so there's going to be an impedance. So the importance of this is that these terminations here will be characterized by some impedance. And the nice thing about that is it allows us to go to more realistic type situations, you know, pure fixed, pure free, we can do all kinds of, put all kinds of, uh, make this quite complicated if we wanted to. Okay, so what's the force here? Well, we've seen this a number of times. This is the transverse force exerted by the string. It's the tension in the string, but it's the, we have to multiply by the slope here to get the vertical or the transverse component. So that's the force. This is just the, it's a complex, because we're thinking of Y is complex. Here's the complex velocity. So, um, Here's the impedance. How do we get the impedance? Well, the normal way is we know what's, what elements are specified in here, and we can just write down the impedance. If you're doing electrical analogy, if, if you, if you, that's what people usually, after a while you just start thinking about this electrically. When you see these mechanical elements in here, you think of them electrically and you write down the impedance. So we usually can just write this down, given what the specific terminations are here. And um, then we need to um, we need to impose the boundary conditions. Okay, the boundary condition is going to be we need to sort of rewrite this to impose the boundary conditions here. The boundary condition when we substitute in what the force of the string is into here. Right? We're evaluating this at x, we're looking at x equal to z right now. We can solve for you. So this is the normal way of stating the boundary condition. And 
This might seem still a little bit mysterious to you, but what we're doing is we're shortcutting Newton's second law. And we're going to look at that next. We're going to look at a special case and prove, that, prove this in a special case. This is really a statement of Newton's second law. Okay, for simple, for uh, motion of a definite frequency, we can easily go from the velocity to the displacement back and forth. It's just, it's much quicker and we can be a lot, we can easily generalize this to all kinds of impedances of determination. So this is the boundary condition for x equals zero. This, we get this, it has the same form at x equals L. But there is a minus sign, remember that's because the string here is coming from the right. Here the string is coming from the left. And I talked about this before, if you think a little bit about it, you'll see that the force exerted by the string, because it's coming from the opposite direction, you've got to put a minus sign here. And of course we put the impedance of this termination, which you know, can be just about anything, just like this one. All right, so before we apply, we're going to look at an example of this, how we would apply this. Let's, to help everybody believe, to believe this, let's, we're going to do a special case, as I mentioned before. So here's the case we're going to do. It's a, a termination. We'll, we'll just, we're just going to focus on x equals zero. Let's not, we, we don't need to worry about here. We're just going to prove the boundary condition. We're going to prove this boundary condition. For this special case, we're going to prove this. And we have a, this is somewhat of a realistic termination. Right? Like a guitar string. Yeah, there's going to be inertia and stiffness. So, um, we'll actually derive this, but I just want to point out to you that it's, we'll have to, <laughs> We use impedance so much that you just can't help yourself. The, it's one of the first things you write down when you see this is this. But the point of this problem is we're actually going to we're going to show that this is that this works. That's what we're going to show. So let's let me make sure everybody understands this. We've how does this termination behave here? Well, we have this mass connected to this spring. At any point, they're going to have the same velocity, right? The string is the spring is tied down here. So electrically, we see an inductor and a capacitor, and um, you know, just in series. So, what's the corresponding impedance for this for a mass? It would be it would be an inductor with some inductance L, and we know that the impedance there is I omega L. That's the um, voltage to current ratio, complex voltage to complex current ratio for an inductor. Right, so we just replace the L with M, the corresponding mechanical quantity. This acts like a capacitor and the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over I omega C where C is the capacitance and the, the capacitance corresponds to the inverse stiffness here. Um, later in the transducers course, this gets, this is so annoying, this inverse relationship and you deal with it so much when you deal with transducers that people don't talk about the stiffness. They talk about one over the stiffness. Except they don't say that. What do they say? Anybody know? Um, oh, I haven't talked to anybody about that. <laughs> Compliance. So we got a word which make, sounds good, right? The stiffness, how stiff, you know, the greater the stiffness, well, the greater stiffer, right? The greater compliance, what does that mean? It's easier to move. So the compliance is simply defined as the inverse stiffness. And then we don't have to deal with this problem of S being 1 over C. So we'll eventually um, make that easier. But not in this course. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, let's we're going to forget the forget about impedance here and just impose Newton's second law at the, at the termination here. So the net force is going to be given by this. It's the at any instant. It's the force, the transverse. We're talking about transverse forces here, right? It's the transverse force of the string, which is given by this. There's another force on this mass, and that's due to the stiffness. Okay, this is Hooke's law right here. And by Newton's second law, this has to be the mass times the acceleration. Well, this is all simple harmonic motion. 
So we can easily, we can write the acceleration as minus omega squared times y, right? Um, okay, so you can see this is a little, this, this is a little complicated. The impedance method just shortcuts, shortcuts this. But let's follow through, it's not that complicated here. Let's, um, we want to head towards impedance, so let's isolate the force. Here's the force over here. Let's bring the spring force over here. And now impedance deals with force and velocity. So I want to get rid of these displacements and represent them as velocities. But that's easy. The velocity is I omega y. That means y is u, the velocity, over I omega. So you see I've replaced this with here with, for simple harmonic motion. Everything's going like e to the I omega t. So I do this here, I can factor this out, and look what you get. Here is the, we can form the ratio, if you like, of the force, the com is a complex force to the complex displacement at the boundary, and we get precisely the impedance. So I think this is um, useful. It shows you, a couple, it, it confirms the impedance approach. It also shows you that you don't want to go through this. We want to do this quickly. We've got no more important things to worry about than struggling imposing a boundary condition. In this case, it's a boundary condition. We just use the impedance and then we get it very quickly. It's just right here. Uh, okay, oh, and you can look at this in special cases. I don't think we really need to do this. But um, infinite impedance, the only way, you know, this is gonna be finite. And if this is infinite, we've got to have zero velocity. So that's a fixed, a fixed termination for infinite impedance. Zero impedance means we're going to have zero force, which means the string has to be, remember this is transverse force here. So it means the string has to have a zero slope always. So we're just confirming what we knew from before. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? All right, so what are we going to do here? So we're going to do a, and again, you want to realize this is a little different perspective than the damped driven case. Here we have no drive, no damping. We're going to ask, we're going to find the normal modes, which most acousticians call standing waves. They don't bother to call them normal modes. But the general idea that covers all kinds of waves, not just acoustics waves, is um, that these are, and, and, and it, deals with mechanical systems of few degrees of freedom, as, as you've seen. The general idea is that they're, they're normal modes, modes with a definite frequency. So how do we uh, find the normal modes here? And normally people would consider the normal modes to be the resonances, all right? And I don't want to talk any more about this. <laughs> KFCS don't really, they don't really think that, but don't worry about it, okay? Most people, the reason they start to they look at normal modes is when you add dissipation and drive, those are going to be your resonances. According to KFCS, that's not always true. But, you know, no, they're not perfect, are they? That's, that's, I don't think they're perfect. So we talked about that yesterday, remember? Okay. All right, so how do we find the normal modes here? Well, we have to satisfy the wave equation. One way to approach it, there are different ways of approaching this, is um, here's a right traveling wave, a left traveling wave. Each of these satisfies the wave equation, and it's a general solution, so we'll superpose them. This is the general solution here for a definite frequency omega, which we don't know yet. We don't know this yet. So it's not being driven at some arbitrary frequency. We're gonna find solutions of definite frequency. Those are the normal modes. Those are the standing wave modes. Let's uh, impose, let's do the, uh, you always want like, to, I've told you before, let's do the easiest thing first. Uh, this is the fixed boundary condition here. So for all time, y has to be zero at x is equal to zero. That tells us at x equals zero, we cancel the, it means that b has to be minus a. All right, so if we substitute this in here, we've been through this before, um, you're going to end up with a sign. Spatially, you're going to end up with a sign here. So it looks like this. And when you see something like this, which we saw multiple times yesterday in the problem set, don't, don't be confused. <laughs> don't let this bother you. This is just some complex amplitude here. 
things. Not really important. The fact that there's a minus 2i is irrelevant. It really is irrelevant because we haven't specified what this a is. We could just absorb this into a. So don't let this throw you off. There's just some complex am amplitude here. Now let's impose, next, let's impose the boundary condition. That's the final thing to do here. Um, we've got a solution to the, we know this is going to solve the wave equation. We've imposed the boundary condition here. The final thing to do to uniquely specify our system is to impose the boundary condition here. Uh, so this is simple, I've rewritten it here in red. This is just the boundary condition. Maybe it's better just to do this to remind you. This is just this right here that we just talked about. And it comes from, it comes from right, it just comes from right here. So the velocity at x equals L is going to be this quantity times the slope. Now we can take our solution here and, uh, and uh, find the velocity, multiply by I omega, right, that's the velocity, and evaluate x at equal, at L. Then we can also take the derivative of this with respect to x and, multi and evaluate it at L. And I've skipped a few small steps here. As I mentioned, I think, before, if you, if, when you have lecture notes like this, if you put in all the steps, everyone's going to go to sleep. Okay? So, so this is the way, and it's even worse with journal articles. Okay? So a journal article will, well, it's in some textbooks. I think, you know, it's just unavoidable. You'll see an equation and they'll say, well, then they'll show you the next equation and they've skipped some steps there. And if you're bothered by it, you should just sit down and go from there to there. And that's the way it is here. If this bothers you and you really want to be satisfied, just do it. It really just takes less than a minute to do this. But I have skipped, skipped a few small steps here. Here's what we get. Now, at this point, this looks confusing. What are we, what's, what's going on here? Well, let's remember, we're trying to find the normal modes. Normal modes, frequencies. But a frequency will imply a wave number. We're trying to find KL here. Like we did before, but they were resonances before. Now they're normal modes. So our unknown, we have one equation here, and we have KL is the unknown. There's going to be a whole infinite spectrum of these, of course. We, we expect that, right? We know it's going to be there. But what's the next thing we have to do with this? Anybody remember? This, to me, this looks very confusing. What do we do? We need to simplify it, right? Put it in a more physical form. And, pardon me? You divide by the sign? Um, yeah, but that's a, a trivial step. We're going to bring this over here, probably and define the, come up with a, oh, we're going to go the other way. We're going to take the sign and put it here and deal with the cotangent. But that's not really the, the thing that we, that's next, really. Remember here, what do we mean? We're going to have simpler behavior when ma this mass is sufficiently large. When it's sufficiently large, it's going to be like a fixed end. When it's sufficiently small, it's going to be free. So what do we mean by sufficient? It's the ratio between the there's got to be, you've got to look around for another mass, and it's going to be the ratio. And in this problem, there's, really, there's only one other mass. Now, in more complicated systems, there could be alternatives. Okay, it's more complicated. But here, there's only one other mass here, and that's the mass of the string. So I know that what's going to be important here is the ratio of those two masses. And the mass better give us that, or we would have made a mistake. That's how strong we, we believe in, in this. Okay, so we went through this before, but it's good. And, oh, and you're going to get to go through this in a different situation on the quiz. And I modified that problem from the past, incidentally. The, the quiz I sent out yesterday, um, you're going to go through the same thing. And I tell you, I'm, I guide you. What to, you want to, you know, when you're taking a test and you're told to do something, it's usually a good idea to do it. Okay? <laughs> no, you laugh, but there are students, and I think I used to be this way, that will say, no, I'm going to do it my way. You know, but you, you really, um, Usually if you're told to do something a certain way, you're, you're expected to follow that path, even though there could be other paths, okay? So do that if you have problems, con you know, contact me. But here, this is similar to what we saw before, 
And it's, you know, it's not real obvious, but the tension is given by this. Here's the mass of the string, okay? And when you play with this, you start make substitutions here. Sure enough, look what we get. That's beautiful. Here's our unknown, a dimensionless quantity. KL is dimensionless, right? This is one over the two pi over the wavelength. We're solved, we put everything in dimensionless form now, and it's very physically transparent. What do we mean by sufficiently large mass on the end? Well, we mean ML over MS is much greater than one. Okay, so how do we solve? This is a transcendental equation. You cannot solve it analytically. We talked about this before. Remember, you can try. Um, so there's a graphical way. You, know, you, shove it, you can shove it on a computer. But even if you do shove it onto a computer, it's really nice to look at the graphical approach. And we're going to see an example of why when we get down here. So this is some function of, of our dimensionless variable KL. This is another function. So I plot this as a function of KL. And this is the flip of the tangent. The cotangent is one over. So instead of giving the usual tangent branches here, they're flipped about pi over two, right? So here they are. That's the cotangent. And it diverges where it's supposed to diverge. And it's zero where it's supposed to be zero. Then I plot this. What's this? Well, it's just a straight line of slope ML over MS. So it looks like this. Previously, we had it down here, but the same idea, right? And now the point is, of course, the intersections. Where these curves intersect, that represents a solution to this equation. They will be our normal modes. And the next thing to do, and we've been through this before, but it's so important, I think it's good to go through it again, is let's look at the limiting cases. So first, what's a large, yeah, a large mass, when ML is much greater than MS, this is going to behave like it's approximately fixed. What does our graphical solution yield? When ML is much bigger than MS, this is going way up. Whoa, this has a big slope, right? So do you see what the solutions are going to go to asymptotically approach? This is going to be close to 2 pi. This is going to be close to pi. What's this one going to be close to? Zero. Yeah, but it won't be exactly zero unless you make the mass infinite. So there's a mode there. We need to interpret that. We will, and we'll get to that. OK, so that's a, um, the string is behaving like a fixed, fixed string, although it's, we, would think the first, we would think that this, this is the half wavelength mode. It's the solution for n is equal to 1 here. So we would think that would be the first mode, but we do have another mode there as long as ML remains finite. But we'll get back to that in a moment. What about the other case where the mass, where it's a very light mass compared to the mass of the spring? Now we're going down here. Now we get, instead of integral solutions for KL, they're now half integral. They're going to be close to the zeros here. And that's a fixed free string. Remember the fixed free string? What's the fundamental mode look like for a fixed free string? Quarter wavelength? Quarter wavelength, right? All right. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here. One of them is you want to make sure, and I haven't, I don't think we've talked about this before. Are these higher modes, look at, look at this right here. Here's our lowest mode. Is, are these harmonics of the lowest mode here? Is this twice that or <coughs> not even close in this case? Yeah, they, they, don't become they only become harmonics in these um, special limiting cases here. So we don't get harmonics. And you might say, well, okay. Uh, but there's an interesting question that I just realized when I was looking over the notes for the second or third time. Um, it would be interesting to hear this, to play tones that where this corresponds to some frequency. You know, start, you can arbitrarily define this to be some frequency and this will be the, the proper ratio here. And it probably is not going to sound real good because in music, it's, there's these overtones are typically harmonics. And it's kind of pleasing for us to hear for some reason. I don't, you know, something going on in our brains. But this would probably sound kind of uh, be a, cl a dissonant or a, cl a clashing kind of sound in our heads. But, but I don't know. 
And I can't believe I've never, I've never thought of this before. But it would be really interesting to dial this up. And I think um, this, this can be done. I think there's actually apparatus that do this, apparatuses that do this. But I made a note for the future to uh, be nice to play this, to, you know. Does everyone get what I'm saying here? It's simple, no? Yeah. <laughs> so um, pick a certain frequency here you know, audible frequency. This is going to correspond to some frequency, this is a f some frequency, this is some frequency. If you play all those at the same time, it's just not going to sound good. It's going to sound weird. Wait, Justin Bieber is? <laughs> Justin Bieber is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, <laughs> I've, I've seen Justin, you know, you can't avoid him, okay? But I always kind of, I look away. <laughs> I can't handle but so I don't know what you're talking about but um, it is interesting at these, these two other special cases here it will sound it will sound pleasant now, they can have different amplitudes too you can play around with the amplitudes but it will probably be but I think it'd be it's great to do that so I made a note of this this is you know, one more demo that needs to be done now there's another interesting thing here and we see this this is called uh, mapping of modes, and acousticians do this a lot. I've done it a lot in teaching and research. You'll notice here that we, we can continuously go from one simple situation, fixed fix, to another simple si situation. Just by t t turning the dial here, the mass, we, we call that, it's an old expression, we turning this knob here by varying this, the value of this mass. We can imagine actually slowly varying it. And the fundamental mode, you know, will go, will, any mode will continuously transform into another mode, going from fixed fixed to fixed free. And I know, um, I don't know how you could appreciate why I'm telling you that this is important. And I can't, I can't really think of any examples right now. But it just tends to come up. When we're trying to get a physical appreciation for a system, we tend to look at special cases. And then it's natural to see how we go continuously from one special case to another. So you could be wanting to do something and make something or some transducer or something, do something. And it's just useful to be able to think this way. Okay, I don't expect you to appreciate that, I'm just telling you, right? But look what happens here. You would think that the fundamental, fixed fixed fundamental, would map into the fixed free fundamental. So you would think that if we start off like this, right? Here's fixed fixed. That if we slowly decrease the mass, that it would go to this. Is that what happens here? Look at the look at our results. Here's the um, the fixed fixed mode is here. The, the half wavelength mode is here. That's n equals one. Where is it? That's okay. It's way. It's up here. As we reduce the mass, we come down here, and what does it go to? Which mode is this? It's the second fixed free mode. <laughs> it's this one. It looks like this. Ah, so this is not right. What's happening here? Now, this is good to know. You we're, we're learning physically about the system. A lot of students, not just the resident students, but the distance learning students, are are taking a much um, uh, too much of a mathematical approach to answering things, especially in the last quiz. That was mainly conceptual. Okay, so this is also conceptual here. What's happening? How do I get, how do I, what mode maps into the quarter wavelength mode? Well, you can see it's this mode that's way up here that's got a very low frequency. What mode is that? Well, it's not exactly zero, okay? No, you've gone too, gone too far, but you're getting, you're close. So at very low frequency, we, we've talked about this before, what's, this, what's the system going to look like here at very low frequency? It's going to be essentially a straight line. The wavelength 
is so big, this is so small here, k is so small, that this, it's just going to be going like this. It's quasi-static. Yeah, that's a mode. That's going to be a mode. It disappears. It goes to zero frequency in the limit as the mass goes to infinity. Yeah? Since it is a straight line, wouldn't it just be a string that's saying there since it's fixed? It's not just as, it's going like this. It's a straight line, but it's changing. It's, this is oscillating at a very low frequency. Even with the mass of infinity? No, no, you, I keep telling you. It's like the third time. <laughs> You're going too far. You've gone to infinity. You see, the whole point here is we're looking at the transition. You, you know, from a f approximately fixed fixed to approximately fixed free. So it's this low frequency mode here that looks like that with essentially, it's almost constant slope, right? It's, it's curved a little bit. It has a very large wavelength. So it's going to be curved. It's going to look like this. And as you reduce that mass, what does it go? You can see it now, can't you? You start with this, with a very slight curvature, and you start, redu you start um, reducing the mass. You start moving along here. And eventually, you go to this. And in between, this is where you know this is where you are in between, between here. So this is, turns out to be useful in the laboratory. Uh, okay, any questions or comments? Okay, so I don't know if you remember this, but when we were talking about dissipation. In, in, in this chapter, chapter on strings, I said that eventually, in the next course, we would actually deal, we would be, we'll be dealing with sound, an actual sound in the next course, and we will put in dissipation. We'll deal with it, instead of a string, there'll be a pipe with sound in there, and we will include the fact that the sound can be dissipated along the pipe. But I told you I didn't think we were gonna do it here. Well, I was, of course, wrong. We're gonna touch on it a little bit, okay? But I don't think we're going to do much more than this in this course. And some of you have been just, it, um, there's this tendency of students to want to get to, when you handle things theoretically, is to jump into a very realistic situation where there's dissipation all over the place. Just, people just naturally think that. And they, people thought about it, thought this way for thousands of years. Right? It was only with, usually it's Galileo, is attributed, is attributed to Galileo this fact that we idealize the motion, we come up with model systems. We know they're not going to perfectly mimic reality. You know, if we know, we know if we have a string in air doing like this, there's going to be some drag, right? But we neglect it. How good of an approximation is that? Well, you have to, you got to decide how, which, how accurate you want to be, okay? That's a, that's a different problem. But the point is, by idealizing the motion, this is what Galileo, you know, Galileo said, forget about friction. And that was revolutionary. Because everyone thought friction was just fundamental. Because anytime you started something moving, it always stopped. So it's obviously a fundamental fact, right? No. He's, you know, he, he considered situations where you, where the friction became less and less. And it, it caused, it, you know, it was part of a scientific revolution because we were able to qu quantitatively go through those ideal models. Once we gain an understanding of what's going on in these idealized cases, then we can go back and make them more and more realistic. But only because we've gone through all the trouble of handling the simpler systems. That was the, that was the big revolutionary idea. So um, why did I launch off into this? <laughs> okay, well anyway, so now we can put this, so we're gonna get, um, a little bit, we're gonna get more realistic here, right? So we're gonna imagine, you know that we can have damping at the terminations, right? You just put in some mechanical resistance, the impedance will have a real part. We know how we can handle that. So how do we handle this uh, other, and that's realistic, you know? When I talked about a guitar earlier, you think it's just gonna be a stiffness and an inertia? No, there's, you know there's gonna be damping, right? So, um, how do we put this in though, the, the like drag, for example, on a s string? Okay, well the first thing I need to tell you, and I, I might have mentioned this before, I can't remember. Typically in cases like this where you have drag, the force is not linear, okay? Like this, 
there's a drag on this that's going to be, do you think it's the force is the resistive force is proportional to the velocity? No. It's only for laminar flow. When this thing's moving through the air, there's turbulent flow here. It's typically proportional to the square of the velocity. It's nonlinear. We're not going to do that. Okay, because we this is all we stick to linear descriptions in this in this course. But I will say this, and I think I've said this before, the and oh, that's what we did with an oscillator. Remember when we put damping in with an oscillator? We took it to be proportional to the velocity. We took it to be linear. And it's a, it's a model. And um, it doesn't work well. You know, it's, it's not going to work well for a string. <coughs> but um, this damp, the, dr the damping on a string due to drag is a pretty small effect anyway. Right? But it's not going to work well because there it's really going to be, it's probably it's going to be closer to being quadratic rather than linear, proportional to the velocity. But it, there is an important case where this, this typically applies and that's transducers. Typically in transducers the, the resistive force is, it is linear, so that's nice. So let me remind you about, uh, this, is an os this is a damped simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, here's a simple harmonic oscillator and we put in linear damping here. And we've divided by the mass, so this is a resistive force per unit mass. How do we carry this over to a string? Well, it's really easy. We just have a resistive force per unit mass of the, of the string here. So our wave equation, we generalize, this is our standard, the standard wave equation. We generalize it, we add this term right here. So that gives us a resistive force proportional to the velocity. So how do we solve this? Now, and some of you are thinking, oh, it's just a differential equation and you know, there's ways you can do this. Well, we have our own way of looking at it here that's much more useful than that. So let me try to motivate this. Um, you know we've gone, com we, you, you know from our, from the pre from our study of a simple harmonic motion, you know, damp driven simple harmonic oscillator that we want the variables to become complex. It makes it much easier to solve the, solve the problem, right? So, and we haven't talked about, we didn't talk about this in the last chapter because it was, we didn't really need to, but when we get into waves, things get more complicated. The thing to do here is, um, We know that this, the motion is going to damp out here. If we start off with some standing wave, it's going to damp out, right? One way to describe that is to go, it's, it's best for me just to assert this, is to go complex with the frequency. Because, I think you sh you sh you'll be able to see this in your head, if we, had an, um, if we have an ima a positive imaginary part of omega, what's that going to give us? Can everybody see that? We got, this is gonna be a, a real part plus an imaginary part. So it's gonna be a real omega plus I alpha. What's I times I alpha? Minus alpha. So if alpha is positive, if the imaginary part is positive, what do we have? Well, we have what you know is gonna describe this. You know this is gonna be exponential decay from our study of oscillators, right? So a trick that we do here that's useful, and we'll do it again. We're doing it here in time, we'll do it um, later on. I don't think in this course, but in the, definitely in the next course. We'll do it in space. We can do it in time and space. But here we're dealing with time, is to let omega becomes com become complex. And to be consistent, you know, we don't, we don't know omega, we should let k become complex too. It turns out that's not gonna matter here, but in general, it's just, it's it's better. You know, we've made everything else complex. Another way of looking at this, you know, we've made everything complex, why not make omega and k complex? You can just take that attitude. So let's do that. We're going to consider this. It's natural to think that this could be a solution. We don't know if this is a solution. We're going to have to find uh, relationships here to make this a solution. But this is natural to assert this. We have this, think of this as a right traveling wave and a left traveling wave. So let's, in, uh, first thing, let's impose the boundary conditions. So we're going to do this for a fixed, fixed string. Here, does this look familiar? We've seen this a number of times today and yesterday, especially yesterday. 
So this is what we get. The difference here is that we've got underscores here that k and omega are complex, but the math just carries right through. Similarly, um, okay, so this is what we get by imposing the boundary condition at x equals zero. Now, at x equals l, we have to have zero. So what's the boundary condition? It's gonna be the sine of k complex l is equal to zero. What are the solutions to this? We've seen this before. It, so it turns out in our problem here, k has to be real, and it's gotta be the usual n pi over l, the thing we've seen many times before. So that's no big deal. But let's go on. Um, we need to satisfy our modified, this is not the standard wave equation. We've modified it. We need to make sure we have a solution. We've imposed the boundary conditions on what we think might be the solution, but we haven't made it a solution yet, so we need to do that. Um, so that's next. Here's our solution is going to be this. And again, don't worry about the answer. This is all linear. We don't really care about the amplitude here. This is the important thing. We substitute this into the equation, and here's what we find. A similar thing happened with a single oscillator. Now you can see we do get a complex omega. You just use the quadratic solution to the quadratic equation here. And we get these two solutions. And the person who wrote these notes, which was me, <laughs> said we have to reject the negative root here. I'm not so sure about this anymore. Um, if you don't reject the negative root, take, let beta become very small. And let beta go to zero. You can see that when beta goes to zero, we're going to get omega is equal to minus ck. Is that right? Is omega equal to minus ck? Have you seen that before? Now, usually we think of it as omega is equal to ck, right? But k is really a directed quantity. The wave number is positive this way. It's negative this way. So I'm suspicious about this. I've got to think about it. I, I, I think... I don't know the answer right yet, but it seems to me that um, we're not really rejecting it. We're just considering right traveling waves here for this. We're, we're considering k to be the, I think it's better to say we're considering k to be the um, absolute value, which we often do, right? You think back, we're, we're just, we've done it so many times now, we just naturally think of k we think of the absolute value of k. I think that's probably the, what's going on here. So for k to be the magnitude, we reject the minus root. So maybe this is just kind of right. So here's what we get. Now, we can see that the damping here, remember this? Remember the, what I called alpha? This is going to give us decay, which we know has got to be there. What's this doing? Well, it's telling us that the frequency of the motion, in the absence of damping, omega is equal to ck. Um, this is telling us how the damping is modifying the frequency of the wave, just like an oscillator. So we get a damped frequency, and I got too hung up here on the oscillator approach. Now, we do, have os we do have an oscillator here. We actually have an infinite number of oscillators. Each mode we're doing a fixed, fixed string. You know we're going to have a, a mode, this, a fundamental mode with half wavelength. The next mode up will have a wavelength. You know they're going to damp out. This is described, this is telling it's damped out. But each mode has its own frequency. So we really should put an omega sub n there. And again, this is very important. I'm going to say it one more time. Um, even for systems that don't have a great Q, even if the Q is equal to 2, or maybe even one. Because this is squared here, this is proportional to one over Q beta, right? The, the frequency tends to be affected very little. It's only for systems that are very severely damped you start to really see a reduction of the frequency. So I've, I've said this many times before. Um, in fact, the tuning fork lab, what happened in the tuning fork lab when you put the eraser in there to put in damping? What happened to the frequency? It goes up, it doesn't go down, right? It goes up. So there is some, di you're adding dissipation to the system, but it was swamped by some other effect, which everyone knows now is what? 
stiffness. The stiffness, right. You, you, we, we introduced damping into the system, the tuning fork, but you also added stiffness. So it, that completely swamped this effect here, which is typically small. This is the important thing, right? It's going to cause the amplitude to exponentially decay. We can substitute back into the equation. Here's what we get. We really should have ends here, K ends. We've, what we found is, and it's not surprising, each one of these standing waves that we have here for a fixed fixed string acts like um, um, an oscillator, a damp, a damp simple harmonic oscillator. We have all these modes here, etc. And each one acts like an oscillator. Its frequency is modified typically a very small amount by the damping, but more importantly, it, it, the amplitude decays. Now, getting back to models and Galileo, all modes decay at the same rate. We were talking about that. I remember Robert commented, you were, the, do, do, when I excite a bunch of modes, do they all decay at the same rate? No. Yeah, I know. It's almost always the higher frequency ones decay more quickly. Our model's not giving us that. This beta is just a constant. So we have to go, to make this more realistic, we have to go back and correct, you know, make it, make it, we have to go back and make the, make the model more realistic. But this is a first step. Okay. Um, so this is going to be a big deal next quarter for sound. And we will actually calculate. See this decay constant here? We, we, just, we just threw it in, right? We just threw this in. This is the coefficient. This is, you know, of the damping parameter here. This gives us the strength of the damping. We will actually derive that from fundamental principles for a sound wave. Um, and then we will see how the frequency dependence well, there's how the frequency, the frequency dependence has to come in here. All these waves, all these standing waves are not going to go down at the same rate. Uh, I don't know if that's a common experience for you, but let's see. Well, you know, it happens in stringed instruments. You, you pluck a string and you listen to it as, it gets, as the amplitude goes down. It gets more and more of a pure tone. It gets less and less interesting kind of sounds hollow sort of it's because all these all the harmonics have, are damping out more quickly than the fundamental so we'll do this we'll um, look at this from a, we call a first principles point of view we'll derive we'll derive the dissipation we won't just stipulate it like a model we'll actually derive it from the fluid dynamics okay um, there's one more thing here I think Uh, so this very commonly occurs when people do any kind of um, standing wave analysis in any kind of system that has standing waves. The standing waves, to a, a very big extent, behave like oscillators, behave like individual oscillators. And that's what we're, when we're seeing this here. Uh, finally, we dealt with tr standing waves here. What happens if there's another a case, another sort of simple case, and that's where you have like a semi-infinite string and you're driving the boundary. So what if we tried to solve that? What's going to happen? We're going to have the same modified wave equation. That's not going to change. But you know it's going to be different. We're not going to get standing waves. We just get these pure traveling waves, right? We get a pure traveling wave if we drive it at some frequency. We're not going to get modes. I mean, the, well, the frequency can be anything for a traveling wave. So how do you think the mathematical description is going to go through in that case? You know the amplitude has to decay. Take a wild guess how it's going to decay. I mean, you know it has to. How is it going to decay? Exponentially, right? You know it has to be. So how do you think that description, how do we do this math, how do we do that mathematically? Take a wild guess. It's decaying in not not in time now, but in x. So for the standing wave problem, this became complex. We had a positive imaginary part. What do you think's 
going to happen for traveling rays. We're going to have an imaginary part. Omega will be real now because that's what we're thinking of actually forcing the string. Omega is just some fixed actual frequency. It's not complex. But now K will be the quantity that becomes complex. That's the natural way to look at this. And that's what we'll do. I, and I think we're not going to talk about it again, I, I think, until next quarter. But that's a makes life a lot easier just to let the, the wave number become complex. And that will give us the, the, the fact that the wave decays. Okay, so does anybody have any um, questions or problems? Sakai was down a lot this morning, but you guys don't really use Sakai too much, do you? Do you? Pardon me? <laughs> okay, in this, I'm in this class. All I care about is this class. <laughs> So, but I'm, I'm sure I have to do some, for the distance learning students, I have to post some assignments and do, do some things. Okay, so remember, um, 8 a.m. Friday, right, lab?